Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here at the European Rover Challenge. I got a chance to walk out on the, the Mars yard over here and see the different um, rover experiments. And it's, it, it was really engaging to see the students working towards building a goal. And it reminded me so much of, of what it took for us to build the Perseverance rover. Now, the challenges here at the European Rover Challenge have been primarily focused on what the rover would do when it's on Mars. But today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, why we went to Mars with the Perseverance rover. Uh, and then the part that we haven't really talked about of getting to Mars. You know, there are a lot of different challenges in the space industry. Uh, the rover challenge is one of them of how do you build a vehicle to, to do the autonomous behavior of sampling and mobility. But another big challenge that we've had is just how to get to Mars, you know, Mars is our closest neighbor uh, and it's similar to Earth in that it has an atmosphere like Earth does. The gravity is about uh, the size of Earth, but it's just far enough to make it a little bit difficult. The atmosphere is just thick enough that uh, you have to account for it. Otherwise you might burn up and, and not get to the surface, but it's not thick enough like Earth where it actually slows you down. So these are all different challenges of how do we get from Earth to Mars to get our rover to the ground safely in order to do its actual mission. So in the first place, when we talk about rovers or uh, science experiments, the main thing we need to talk about first is why. Why are we sending these robotic missions to another planet? What do we hope to learn that would be beneficial for us as humans here on on Earth. You know, the first exploration of Mars happened back in the 1970s. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA sent a series of spacecraft called the Mariner spacecraft to visit Mars. You know, back in those days, <clears throat> when, they, when they sent the spacecraft to Mars, we only knew what we could see of it from Earth. And we could see a vision of Mars. We saw canals of what looked like canals across Mars. And the first thought of humans here on Earth was, well, they look like canals that we maybe have here. So maybe there are Martians who actually dug those canals and there's people there in cities and that's what we're seeing. So there was a lot of excitement in sending those first missions to Mars because there was a hope that, you know, we would find a planet that was somewhat like ours. <clears throat> we got there uh, and the first images that came back were not of cities or civilizations, but of a very dry, barren, lifeless, basically what looked to us to be lifeless uh, planet. So then it was like, oh, now there's no Martians. Let's go find somewhere else. And then there was a whole campaign to explore the solar system. And for a long time, that was it. There was not that much more exploration of Mars. And then in the 1990s, in the late 90s, uh, NASA decided to go back to Mars. But this time, it didn't go back with an expectation of what uh, it would see, it went with the, with the plan of what it wanted to, to do and what it wanted to find. And the idea was, compared to all the, the celestial bodies that we had now explored in the solar system, Mars is still as similar as we think as we can get to of Earth. So the idea was, well, we really want to know if, if there is life elsewhere in the solar system. The implications of that answer would be profound for our society. Of could we actually prove that we are not alone in the universe? And that's a very big question, admittedly, and it takes a lot of data, and, and we may not be able to get to the answer, but we thought, well, maybe our first best chance to answer it is to look to Mars and see if our closest neighbor that maybe used to be like Earth could give us some clues as to whether that was the case or not. But our pictures of a very dry, barren planet, it's not like we had the remnants of a city that we could go, oh, you know, here are some fossils, here's a city, that must mean there are, there are people there. We had to come up with a plan of what it would mean to look for life elsewhere in the solar system. So the first thought was, here on Earth, almost all, almost all life uh, is close to water of some sort, whether it's oceans or rivers or, or lakes, there is water and almost is almost necessary for all life that we find on this planet. 
<clears throat> so the idea was, well, maybe that should be our first tiny little step. Let's see if we can find the water. So that was the first main goal here of the, the Mars exploration plan. So when we went back in the 90s, it wasn't with a plan of just doing a one-off mission. It was, we're going to try to set us up for finding the signs of life on another planet. We're first going to find the water. And if we can find the water, then maybe that'll lead us to areas where it's not just water, but it's the building blocks for life, those advanced molecules like the carbons and the nitrogens that we see in life forms here. Maybe we can find those molecules there, and then they would leave us, lead us to uh, maybe fossil evidence of things that were created by life. This is the plan for NASA. Now, there's a whole bunch of missions here, and I admit this slide is a little bit out of date, um, a whole bunch of missions because it wasn't just we're only going to do this with rovers. To, in order to find the water, to follow the water, to be able to go to different areas, we really need uh, a comprehensive plan. So NASA put um, together a plan that not just involved rovers, but also landers and orbiters. So from these multiple perspectives, with the orbiters uh, having a global perspective of all of Mars and the landers having a, a very detailed perspective of just one part of, of Mars and the rovers kind of filling the gap in between of going to one area but being able to scout out a little bit more. We thought we could piece together enough to find um, a path forward to finding life. Now I'm only going to talk about the rovers today since we are here at the European Rover Challenge. Uh, and the very first rover was actually a very tiny rover. It was with the Mars Pathfinder mission. Pathfinder itself was a, a lander, um, but it carried with it a technology demonstration, which was the Sojourner rover, which you can see here uh, on the, the tiny bottom here. Uh, Sojourner was the size of a cereal box or so, so kind of like a, a baby rover. Um, and the entire purpose of Sojourner was can we can we rove on Mars? Can we drive on Mars? Will the wheels sink? Will they actually move forward? Can we get any grip? So it didn't have any science equipments. It just had a little bit of a solar panel and a radio to talk back to Pathfinder. And all it did was it drive around a little bit to a nearby rock and, and then come back. But the success of Sojourner that proved that we could actually drive on Mars, which had never been done before at that point, led to NASA thinking, well, <clears throat> if we can drive on Mars, then maybe we don't need the lander, just put everything in the rover and drive the whole suite of instruments around. That led to the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, uh, twin rovers, because twice is always better than once. They landed on different parts of Mars a few months apart, and they were able to um, actually find evidence of past water on Mars almost immediately after landing on Mars. Um, they called it a almost a, a hole in one from the Earth because as soon as they got there, just the landing spot itself, when Opportunity looked around, it saw signs of past water on Mars. Now, water is a tricky thing, right? On, on Earth, uh, water comes in many different forms, right? If you uh, if you've been to the salt mine here in Krakow, there's a whole salt lake down down there in the mines. Um, there's acidic water in different parts of the earth. What life needs, or what most life needs, is the the neutral liquid water that is um, that doesn't react very much that supports that life. So we we found the water, but not quite the water that we wanted to. So it was a matter of going and and continuing to find um, the water. But over the course of the Spirit and Opportunity missions, they were designed to last only 90 days on Mars, but they ended up lasting years, actually more than a decade on Mars. And over that lifetime, they found conclusive proof of evidence of past liquid water <clears throat> on Mars that was in the neutral spectrum. And they didn't find this by actually like finding a lake or a river. They found this by finding the evidence of what water would have caused. So things like smooth pebbles that would have only been caused by liquid water running over the pebbles time and time again over years in order to create that smoothness. These are the type of evidence that these rovers are looking for. So now going back to our plan here. So in, with Sojourner, we proved that we could actually use rovers as a way of exploration. 
with the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers here in the 2003-2004, we actually found um, the water that we thought we were looking for over the course of its mission. So the next big mission was the Curiosity Rover in 2011. <clears throat> Curiosity was not just gonna find the water, but it was gonna find uh, the building blocks for life. Now Curiosity, in order to do this, had to actually carry its own laboratory on on its back, basically. So you can see it's much bigger than Spirit and Opportunity. Spirit and Opportunity come, the, the top of the mast here on, on Spirit and Opportunity come up about five feet about here. Um, Curiosity and also Perseverance are much bigger, much broader. Um, they wanted to actually ex do a long-term experiment. So uh, not for 90 days, but over a year or two on Mars at the minimum. So instead of solar panels, they um, had a nuclear um, power pack basically as what their battery was. Um, and this provided energy regardless of whether there was dust storms or, um, or solar power. This was all great. Curiosity was a huge step up in terms of rovers. Uh, the biggest problem was it was much, much bigger than anything we had ever landed on Mars before. The Viking missions uh, had landed from, um, were a pair of missions where there was an orbiter and then the lander part. So they actually had a pretty soft um, release because they stayed, they were released from Martian orbit. But when we got to the Pathfinder mission, uh, NASA was like, no, no, we want to get there more cheaply, more effectively. So we're going to ditch the crew stage and we're going to come straight from Earth to Mars and land directly on the surface of Mars. So for Pathfinder, Spirit, and Opportunity, um, the grand plan was to cover the rover in balloons uh, in order to land safely on Mars. So we come screaming in uh, at interplanetary speeds, um, release a big supersonic parachute in order to slow us down, um, which does work on Mars because we have an atmosphere. Unfortunately, it doesn't get us slow enough that we can land safely at those speeds. It's still very fast. Um, because the atmosphere is just not thick enough for the parachute to slow us down. Uh, so in order to be safe when we're coming in on those parachute speeds, uh, we used a few rockets to just slow us down a little bit. And then on this rope, uh, the rover was um, lowered. Uh, and then we would inflate these balloons after um, lowering it, cut the rope, and then the balloon encased rover would drop to the ground and then bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce until it finally came to a stop. The rover itself would uh, pop the balloons, puncture the balloons from the inside, balloons would deflate and the rover would drive happily off on its way. Uh, now that worked great for Spirit, Opportunity and Pathfinder, did not work for Curiosity. Um, and primarily because when you put a big, big rover inside this balloon and case it. We couldn't make the balloons strong enough that when they impacted the surface, when they hit the surface going that fast with that big of a rover, uh, that they wouldn't just pop automatically. There was enough little rocks on the floor scattered around that any little rock, the tiny sharpness of that would just pop the balloon from the outside um, because of the speed at which it is crashing onto the, onto the surface. So they had to invent a completely new system for Curiosity. Some of you may have seen it, and this is called the Sky Crane Maneuver, where um, instead of, instead of uh, dropping the rover, cutting the bridle and letting it bounce, the rover is actually lowered um, until its wheels touch the ground safely before it, it goes off. Now that, that same system is used for Curiosity and Perseverance, worked very well for two landings. Um, Perseverance though did need one major upgrade to that. And it was because of where on Mars we wanted to go for Perseverance. Now, Pathfinder, Spirit, Opportunity, and even Curiosity had landed basically in the parking lot, the nice, flat, empty space um, on Mars that was next to the science that the scientists wanted to, 
to see because scientists and, and engineers don't always agree of what is interesting or safe. So this is a map, a, a color fixed map of Jezero Crater. This is where Perseverance landed on Mars. When scientists look at this map, they see all sorts of interesting things that they want to go explore. So <clears throat> the reason Jezero is exciting is because we think it was an ancient lake on Mars for many thousands of years. The rim of that lake uh, is in this uh, side of the image. Um, and then you can see what looks like a river channel that's actually flowing in to this basin. It has a delta here, and then there's this cliff-like portion. So if you've ever been to a beach or to a very deep lake, you walk out on the beach, uh, and then it's, it's pretty shallow for a while, and then it suddenly gets very deep, right? Your your foot goes down and it gets very deep. Uh, that's basically what this cliff is. So the bottom part here is what you would consider the, the very deep part of the lake. Uh, these are the shallows uh, of that lake, and then this is the river inlet flow. This is all exciting because with one landing area, which is this white circle, here, that's the, the de targeted area that we wanted Perseverance to land on, you could get to all of these different types of features. You could pick rocks from the, the bottom of the lake bed. You could get the, the sediment from the, the nice shores of the lake and potentially even drive up these channels to get the river rocks up here. So scientists, very excited. They had actually proposed this for curiosity, um, but the <laughs> engineer said, no. You can't land here. This is a 300 meter cliff. If you land your rover, and it, this white circle represents anywhere that the lander can land in, because that's our accuracy of how well we can target Mars from here on Earth. If you land on this cliff, you're dead. You might fall off. If you land here uh, in this area, these are sand dunes that the rover can't drive out of. If you land over here, these are rock fields of rocks that are big enough to hurt the rover, but not big enough for us to see from orbit. So we can't guarantee that it's safe. So for curiosity, the engineers were like, no, we, no, you're not landing here. So they picked a different place, which is uh, Gale Crater, which is basically uh, a nice, flat, smooth parking lot next to Mount Sharp, which was the science that they wanted to go. But Perseverance, Perseverance is the first leg of Mars sample return. Ideally, the samples that Perseverance collects will one day come back to Earth here that we can analyze. Because in all our quests to find the signs of past life, spirit and opportunity found the water. Curiosity actually found all of the building blocks for life. It found the carbons, the nitrogens, all of the ingredients that you need for life. We found all of the pieces of that. So Perseverance's job, given that we found the water, we found all the, the ingredients, was to find if there were signs of past life. So these samples are excessively important. Imagine if you got one chance to come to Earth. You're an alien species. You got one chance to come to Earth, and you had to pick a spot to see whether there was life. If you went to a spot in the, and you can only drive around for a few hundred meters, it's not like you can fly around and go to different places. If you picked a spot in the Atacama Desert or on an ice shelf in Antarctica, the stuff you see around there is not gonna, is gonna tell you that there's no life on Earth because you're not gonna be able to find it. So going to a place that has the best chance of finding the preserved signs of life was really important. But the engineers were like, well, you don't want a broken rover at the end of the landing. You need it to still work. So what can we do to ensure that Perseverance lands safely uh, in this very, very challenging regime? And to do this, we actually created a whole new technology that hadn't been flown on Mars uh, in that way called Terrain Relative Navigation, which I will get to um, in a little bit uh, when I talk about the landing. So now we have our why of why we're going to Mars. We have our where of wh where we're going to Jezero Crater and why. Uh, now we have to actually design Perseverance. Um, so it took about eight years to design Perseverance. We started basically just after Curiosity landed. Um, we took a lot from Curiosity. So Perseverance and Curiosity are 
uh, very closely related, much like big brother, you know, little brother, big sister, little sister type of um, relationship. Uh, there are four phases in a mission that I'll talk about. For the European Rover Challenge, a lot of you have been focusing on this last phase, which is the surface mission. How do you actually traverse around? How do you go uh, find the samples? Um, how do you do that autonomously? I'm going to talk a little bit today about the first three phases. So while this is the important scientific part and it lasts the longest, uh, it cannot happen without successfully getting to Mars. So you need to launch. This is getting off the surface of Earth. Uh, you need to get to Mars um, through interstellar space and then you need to land um, on Mars. So get from interstellar space down to the surface of the ground. Uh, so to give you a little context, uh, there is a lot of equipment and hardware and parts of a spacecraft that are required to get it to the surface of the, of the ground that is not the rover, right? So the rover in this picture is this, uh, this tiny part that is nestled in this cocoon of all of the other parts of a spacecraft. And you can, so the, this picture on, on, um, on my right, on your left, is the actual spacecraft just before it was buttoned up and put into the launch vehicle. And you can see the Perseverance rover all tucked up with its wheels tucked up inside, um, inside the back shell here. So the other parts of the spacecraft are for the other phases of the mission after launch. So the top portion of this is called the crew stage. So this is the part, uh, is basically an almost separate spacecraft that was built that attaches on to the top. And this has all of the instruments and sensors to navigate in um, interplanetary space to get from Earth to Mars. So it's meant to operate outside in the vacuum of space. Uh, the other parts of this is in order to land Perseverance safely. So given that we come really, really fast into the Martian atmosphere, uh, we generate a lot of heat from that as part of the impact of the, the rover in uh, the atmosphere of Mars. So the bottom part of this, uh, the gold aspect that you can see here uh, and here, that's the heat shield that protects us uh, from, protects the rover from the atmosphere as it comes in. The top part of this is called the back shell. Um, as part of this back shell, uh, when it's all closed, it forms an entry capsule that kind of cocoons the rover so that it's not exposed uh, to that high environment and protects it as it's coming into the atmosphere. That back shell also carries the parachute with it. So in this um, top little cone cut out, the parachute is all completely like folded in um, and that gets released during landing itself. And then the final part is, uh, this is called the powered descent vehicle. It is basically the jet pack of the rover. So because Mars's atmosphere is not quite thick enough to slow uh, down all the way with a parachute, and because for Perseverance and Curiosity, we wanted to land in a very uh, specific place um, and with a specific velocity, we didn't we couldn't do the bouncing around that uh, Spirit and Opportunity could have. We actually have a jetpack that once you get slow enough, uh, the back shell is released and the jetpack flies the rover over to where it uh, wants it to touch down, actually lowers the ro rover on a series of um, bridles until the rover is safely on the ground and then it cuts the bridles and then it goes and, and crashes elsewhere on Mars. So at the end of the landing sequence, even though this is all the stuff that gets launched from Earth, the only thing that is left intact on the surface of Mars is the rover itself. Everything else is jettisoned and, and released and goes and crashes different places on Mars except the rover itself. To give a size context, uh, one of these trusses um, that's holding the heat shield, that's about the size of a person. So. All of this is packaged together and sealed up uh, and is this is the whole um, crew stage and entry capsule all put together. Uh, you can see a sense of scale. There's a large cabinet here, so a person would be about uh, part way up this side. Um, this now even looks smaller because it goes into the launch vehicle. Uh, this is the fairing of the launch vehicle. So then it, uh, we put this inside this big fairing and then close it and put this part on top of the rocket, which is here. So that whole part that you saw then gets put on the very tippy top of this rocket. 
Um, Perseverance launched successfully on uh, July 30th. Uh, 2020 during the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, it was a very exciting launch. Um, we had to do things completely differently given the pandemic and we couldn't all be in mission control. And then about 10 minutes before they hit the button for um, launch, we have an earthquake also uh, in mission control. So that was fun of having to, to do uh, both at once. But um, we, even given the pandemic, we had a couple of delays uh, with the um, fueling of the rockets. We managed to sort uh, all of that out and still launch um, in the targeted window in 2020, which was excessively important. It is not easy to get from Earth to Mars. Um, and there are very nice opportunities that come, come up, but you have to time it right. So getting to Earth to Mars is like having a slingshot and a rock, which is your your spacecraft, uh, and trying to hit a target, except you're moving, the target's moving at different speeds, uh, and you have to make sure you know how strong your slingshot is, that's the rocket, how, how big and massive your rock is, that's your spacecraft, in order to say whether you can use this opportunity, the timing being right, to get from Earth to Mars when all the pieces are moving. Uh, Perseverance managed to fit in that nice narrow space to get a type one trajectory. So those of you who may have had a little bit of astrodynamics, this is called a Hohmann transfer. Uh, and basically what that means is this is the shortest trip that you can make from Earth to Mars. And that's because you're only doing a half loop around the solar system. There are other trajectories um, that will take you know, type two gives you one loop around the solar system, type four gets you one and a half loops around the solar system. But if you can, it's ideal to to take the quickest way because that means you're, you're at your destination um, quicker. That means you're in space for a less amount of time. You know, space is a very challenging environment. The longer you're there, the more surprises that you might get. Uh, so we were really aiming to launch uh, in this opportunity. There was only three weeks out of this year in 2020 that we could launch and still hit this uh, trajectory. Um, and if we missed those three weeks, we'd have to wait about 26 months before that opportunity came again. So you can imagine how grateful we were that we actually got off the ground despite pandemic, despite earthquakes um, preventing it. So it took about six months, a little over six months to get from uh, Earth to Mars. So this was where Earth was at the time that we launched, and this is where Mars was. Uh, and then this is where Mars was when we actually got there and where Earth was. So a little bit of a slingshot, but our rock is not just a, a dumb massive rock. It does have the ability to correct itself. So even if our launch vehicle, our slingshot wasn't super precise, um, we actually have the opportunity to maneuver ourselves in space to make sure that we hit uh, Mars, where we want to be. Um, Perseverance used what's called a fixed arrival date, which meant despite what day we launched over that three weeks, we had designed all of the maneuvers for uh, these three such that we knew we were going to land one way or the other on February 18th, 2021. So it's an incredible uh, feeling to know, you know, six years before the actual day when your job will end. So eight years of working on this mission, six years of us knowing what day that will be, um, we actually had a pretty smooth ride uh, over those six months. <clears throat> we used the first trajectory correction maneuver. This was in order to clean up whatever the launch vehicle may or may not have done correctly. Uh, trajectory correction number two, these two, between two and three, they're used to actually target um, Mars. So we kind of split it up into two burns just to get a little bit more um, efficiency. So with the third one, we targeted Mars. Uh, these last three are just in case like stuff was going off course and we, we needed to correct it. For Perseverance, that didn't actually happen. So with the third one that was over 60 days before landing, uh, we were right on course all the way to, to the very end. Um, 300 million miles over six and a half months to get to landing day. <clears throat> now, Landing day uh, is also sometimes called the seven minutes of terror. Uh, and this is because it takes seven minutes for 
the vehicle to get from the top of the atmosphere, where we call entry, um, to the bottom safely. But Earth and Mars are so far apart at this, at this time that it actually takes light um, about 11 minutes to get from Mars to Earth. Now, all of our information about Perseverance travels at the speed of light from Mars to Earth. But that means that any information that we get is delayed by those 11 minutes of how long it took uh, for the, the information to travel at the speed of light from Mars to Earth. When your landing is only seven minutes, that means before, by the time you hear that it's at the top of the atmosphere, it's already on the ground. It's really actually already on the ground, either successful or not. You just don't know, but you won't hear about it for another few minutes. So because of that, there's no way to joystick it. I know some of you in the European Rover Challenge, you have the, the option, right, of, to be able to, to joystick it and stand there and figure out what it needed to do. We don't have that option. So about an hour to two hours before it's supposed to hit the top of the atmosphere, we actually turn off the transmitter. At this time, even if it wanted to, Perseverance is just not listening to the ground. It's not going to hear us. It's not going to do what we say. Everything from that point on is completely autonomous. Over 500,000 lines of code, over six configurations that it needs to go through uh, from the top of the atmosphere to the ground, 180 pyrotechnic devices, explosions basically, that need to happen, all in perfect sequence over those seven minutes in order to get to the ground safely. So about 10 minutes before we hit the top of the atmosphere, the first thing that happens is we jettison the crew stage. So the part that's gotten us from Earth to Mars, that's the first thing that we say goodbye to. So that goes off. Now, um, during cruise, we had actually been spinning like a top to keep ourselves pointed really well. Uh, but now that we're coming into Mars, we we spin down, we undo that spin, and we actually turn um, in order to get to the right uh, attitude to enter the Martian atmosphere. We eject um, some balanced masses. We basically throw some masses off, and this is to create a lift vector. So during cruise, we were a very balanced top spinning on its way to Mars. Now we eject one half of uh, masses off the side, and that actually gives us a lift vector. And we do this because with that lift vector, because there is an atmosphere, we can actually fly the spacecraft like an airplane through the atmosphere at the top. So as it's going through the atmosphere, as it's doing this peak deceleration, uh, before it jettisons the parachute, it's actually flying like a plane, uh, conducting a series of S curves as it flies. And this is in order for it to actually um, hit its target of where it wants to go. If it's coming in uh, a little fast, it'll do a little bit more S-curves so that it controls its distance. If it's coming in a little slow, it can do a little shallower S-curves so that it's on track to hit the target. Now, when we're going at the right speed and we're uh, past this deceleration, we eject the parachute, the largest supersonic parachute that has flown to date. Um, this is critical for slowing us down. It's also one of our big um, single point failures. We only have one chute. If the chute doesn't work, you hit the ground at supersonic speeds and there's, there's no recovery. Um, with the chute, though, uh, there's a little bit of smarts that we put into that chute trigger. Um, so in Curiosity, the way they deployed the chute was they had a sensor that said how fast you're going, basically like a speedometer on your car. I'm going this fast, this fast, this fast. And then as soon as it tripped, OK, I'm, I'm just over uh, going fast enough, going slow enough that I can deploy my chute, it would deploy the chute. Now, we realized that that's great for landing safely, but that also means that you might be going through the atmosphere on the chute a little bit longer than you wanted. And the thing about the chute is you are at the mercy of the Martian winds. And of all the things that we can model on Mars, winds are one of the hardest things to model. I'm sure when you walk around, you can tell, even if you know it's windy, you can't predict where the gust is coming from or where it'll take you. And it can move our, our spacecraft around when it's on the parachute based on those winds. So the longer you spend on the parachute, the more you're susceptible to the winds blowing you off course. Um, that you have to potentially clean up later. So for Perseverance, we made one change, a single line uh, change to the code that said, okay, we're gonna deploy when we're slow enough, 
but also when we're close enough to the target. We're not going to deploy too soon or too late. We're going to wait until we're in this box of going just the right speed and just the right distance. Uh, and that actually improved our landing accuracy by over 40%, that one line change in logic of how we deployed the supersonic chute. Now, once you're on the chute, uh, we release the heat shield because you don't need it anymore. Now you're going slow enough that the, the vehicle can tolerate it. And for the first time, now you can look at the ground. Now, Curiosity had primarily used a radar to land on the ground. And this is kind of like you hold your hands out, you close your eyes, you hold your hands out, and as soon as you hit the wall, that's, that's when you know you're close enough. And if you hit the wall, you stop walking because you don't want to smash your face into the, into the wall. That's sort of what Curiosity did. As soon as it, it saw the ground and it knew how far it was from the ground, um, based on what it could measure, it would stop it and knew it was safely on the ground. That's great if you just wanted to get to the ground safely, but for Perseverance, because the region was so hazardous, it wasn't enough for us to touch down safely on the ground because it wasn't safe depending on where in that landing site you go. We had to know where we were in that landing site. So for Perseverance, we had a camera. So while we were on the parachute, we actually took images of uh, our descent and processed those images to figure out where we are. So this is like, what we do naturally as humans. We use our eyes, we look at the ground, and we figure out where we are. And based on where we are, we can say, I don't want to land on that ledge. I don't want to jump on that rock. I'm going to go pick this nice flat spot. So once it had done that, it figured out where we are. It had picked the spot. At that time, we're going slow enough that the parachute's not going to slow us down any further. So we cut the parachute. Uh, we come in on the jetpack. The jetpack maneuvers us over to where um, the landing site that we selected was. It lowers the rover uh, on a series of bridles until the rover touches ground. Um, and then it cuts the bridles. The jetpack flies away, crashes somewhere else um, so that it doesn't actually land back on the rover. So now the rover is safely uh, on the surface of Mars, not just um, touched down safely, but in a region that uh, it can survive landing in. So uh, I think I have a little bit more time. So to give a little bit more details about that's terrain relative navigation, um, it comprises of three parts. So I talked about one, which is the camera that looks down to actually image the ground as you're coming down. It, we built a special computer for that camera uh, that had advanced processing capabilities that could actually take those images fast enough and do all the thinking that you needed to do to output, OK, I, I took the image, I thought about it, and this is where this is where I am. And it used a map that we generated that we had given it um, prior to, we had actually loaded prior to it that was generated based on orbital imagery of here's your map, those are your eyes, now this computer is your brain and it figures it out based on uh, what it sees and compared to the map of where it is. It uses um, a little bit of its uh, inertial measurement unit just to stitch together so it kind of like how you're your ear tells you whether you've gone one way or the other in between your eye blinks um, to find a safe landing spot. Now, this is a map of the same Jezero crater that we saw before. The black circle here is what the white circle was before. But now it's color coded based on our assessment of how safe that particular spot is. Red is bad. Blue is good. Blue and green are good. Uh, if you can't see very clearly, that's because there's a lot of red. There's a lot of red in here. And as I mentioned, some of these are inescapable hazards, which means you could technically land on them, but then the rover can't drive out. Some of these are rock fields that um, we could see big rocks and then our guess at how many little rocks there are were so much that uh, we wouldn't be able to not land on a little rock, so that was bad too. Some of these are slopes that if the lander or the rover were to land on, it would just slide down and then you couldn't control whether it fell over. And then some of these are cliffs because uh, there is this big cliff in the middle. So as we were coming in, as we were flying, as the rover was autonomously flying uh, to land on Mars, that's what this white line represents. That's the rover's actual path um, as it landed. Uh, it was coming in a little, um, a little fast and to the south more so than it would be. So our best guess uh, during all the design phase, we were hoping it was going to land here because there was a big patch of blue uh, right underneath the cliff that we called our landing strip. 
um, it did not land there. Uh, it went a little long. So uh, by the time it had to make the decision, which was the green part of this line, um, it's in these rock fields over here. Uh, so it has to find a safe site in one of these rock fields. So it found a little green pixel uh, in between all this red um, and landed there. So did actually find a spot, a parking spot that it could find amongst all the different hazards. Um, it was supposed to land within 40 meters. That was about how we had determined that it had to be that accurate. Otherwise, it couldn't fit into these small green dots in between the red. Um, on the day of landing, 300 million miles from Earth to Mars, it, uh, it was coming in a little long, found its place, uh, landed to within five meters of the spot that had actually picked on Mars. So I'm particularly proud of that because that's one of the parts that I worked on a lot and tested a lot, which is uh, very nerve wracking because there's no way you can test all of entry, descent, and landing on Earth. The gravity is just not the same. The atmosphere is just not the same. So we have to test this all in pieces uh, and with simulation. So the only the only day that all of the pieces come together is landing day itself. So you're just praying that you didn't forget anything during those tests. Um, so the way that the lander vision system works to figure out where uh, where Perseverance was is very much like what we do naturally as human beings. We take images or pictures with our eyes and we compare them to a map. And in order to compare them to a map to figure out where you are, the first thing you do is you look for features, right? I see that street sign over there. I see that big building over here. And I, I see, you know, this monument. And then you look at your map and say, okay, where are those features or there, those landmarks on the map? Like, oh, okay, I see these three. And then you, you know, rotate the map and you're like, oh, okay this is the direction in terms of what I see, and then you can figure out where you are and what direction you're pointing. That's basically what the lander vision system is doing. So the first phase is a course phase where it takes three images uh, in a series and it picks 15 features um, total, and then looks at all three of them at once, compares them to a map, and tries to get a solution. This is pretty good. It gets us to about um, 200 meters accuracy with those large uh, pixels. But in order to land safely at Jezero, we needed a little bit better performance. So then we go into a fine mode, which does basically the same thing, but now it does it uh, every second. Um, it does one image, and it now not just uses five features on that image, but over 100 features. So you can imagine as you're walking down and you're looking at the map, we generally tend to do like three or four images to, to find our way. Imagine if you could do 100 and then have to get all 100 to match up to your map, you could get a really good estimate of where you are because there's only one way that all of them are going to line up in order to to fit all of what you see and that's basically what it does the more features you have the more points you have that there's only one way that it can fit and that tells you really well where uh, where you are now as we were designing um, this got us down to our accuracy of 40 meters uh, but it wasn't just for a a good day, we had to make sure that we could reach those accuracies over any day that we could land on Mars. And that could mean it was a really sunny day or it was a really dusty day. It could mean that we were coming in very fast or very slow, that we were coming in super wobbly on the shoot or uh, very still. Any of those cases, we had to make sure that we worked um, our way around it because this was one of the critical features that enabled us to find the safe spot in which to land. I think I'm running a <clears throat> little low on time. So just a, a few images. This is, um, I know this is very technical, but this is a way of visualizing what we tend to do as humans in the mathematical speak of the images. So the bottom is uh, the map. So this is the map of Mars that we gave it of the, the landing site. Uh, and the top is the descent image. So what we're trying to do is to map this image that was taken uh, as it was landing to this one. So the first thing we do is we find features. So the dots are everything that the algorithm decided could be a, a feature. And then we cut out little pieces of it. And then we um, move the map around, or what we call normalize it, in order to get it to wait. And then we take that piece of the map and basically look all over a uh, piece of the image and look all over the map to see if there's a match. Imagine you have like a, a puzzle piece and you have the grid. You're just scanning to make sure 
to see where best it fits. Uh, and when we get a match, we get this high correlation and we get this top peak saying, okay, that's the most likely match for that piece of the image is this part of the map. And then we repeat it for each of the features and that lets us have those pieces where like, okay, for each of your piece, each of the features you identified, they're in this orientation, so they fit this way on the map. And when you have each of those, the only way that the spacecraft can be to fit them, that's what gets you your, your position of your vehicle. And then we do the same thing with the find mode, uh, where it's the same process, except now it's not just uh, big features, it's all these tiny features. Uh, and you're looking in a small portion of the window because you have a better guess of where you are. So you don't have to look over the whole map, you can just look over a part of the map because you already have a little bit of guess of where you are. So we look over a smaller piece of the map that lets us do it faster, uh, but we're still looking for the same correlation where we get the peak of this. So I showed these two uh, because I have a little video of what it actually looked like on landing day. Um, so just to give a little context, the top portion of the, uh, of the screen here, that is the actual image from the lander vision system camera during Perseverance's landing. Um, it's a little dark, mostly because, uh, you know, we didn't set the exposure quite right. But even though it looks dark to our eyes, the algorithm still worked well. Um, this is the whole map of the Jezero crater that we had given it. So you can kind of see the channel here that we had shown and then the, the ridge of the crater. Um, this blue area is the zoom in of what is this big area. So you'll see as it goes through the video, this blue area, the blue box, uh, is what is shown on, um, on this big portion over here, but it will change what view you get of the, the map. The green boxes are the features that I talked about, the part that it's picking out of what to compare to. Um, the red box over here and over here, that is what the image looks like on the map. So this uh, white and red shaded area, that's the left corner of this image. And I point that out because um, even if we put the image as square or it comes into the camera square, it doesn't mean that you're taking a, uh, a nice square image on the ground. If you've ever used like the 0.5 zoom on your uh, phone, you'll know that it, it goes back and it gets a very distorted uh, view of what you're looking at. That's kind of what happens here. As you go further or as the vehicle, um, as you tip over, what you see isn't directly in front of you. It also can be slanted of what you see. So knowing what that angle is, uh, is important for this matching. Um, I will say, Green means good again. So the features that were um, marked in green squares, those are the ones that were actually used in the algorithms. Um, there are blue squares also. Those were the ones that uh, were good, but we had enough, so we didn't need to use them. And then there are other colors like red and orange pink. Those were not used for whatever reason. We had a lot of um, techniques in there to throw them out. Maybe they were too close to the edge or the, the correlation peak wasn't high enough. So the algorithm was like, mm, this, this seems like a sketchy sketchy uh, feature, it's probably not, the quality is probably not as good. We're not going to corrupt our estimate by including it. So the key was we wanted to get a lot of features that were good to get a good solid uh, solution. So hopefully this works. Okay, so you can see we're just past the course phase, we're into the fine, so we have about 150 um, green squares here and they're all over uh, the map. But as you can see, the image and the blue map area is getting smaller and smaller because as we descend, we only see a smaller and smaller portion of the ground of what's uh, below us. Eventually, this we'll get. Uh, this is when the rover tips over. So now it's actually already figured out where it is, uh, and it's flying over to it. So the way the rover flies, because all of its engines are pointing in the same direction, actually has to completely tip over 45 degrees and push its engine so it flies over. Uh, and then to stop itself, it turns over the other way which you can see here, turns over the other way really drastically in order to stop itself before it rights itself and then goes straight down. I think that's the end of the movie. So that's an example, not just of the why and the where we go, but a little bit of the technical details of how we enabled uh, landing perseverance at Jezero Crater. Um, and I wanted to point out that this could not have been possible without a huge number of people who made this happen. Uh, this is just one image um, from like the middle of the development. I am this tiny person over here amongst the sea uh, of people. And this is only the ones that were at JPL. It was a 
very um, collaborative thing across multiple NASA centers, and the rover especially also had a lot of international partners, um, especially on the science instruments. Uh, and this was the last picture we took on landing day, like about an hour before we sat into uh, sat in um, our consoles for the last time. Uh, we are holding up peanuts because there is a big superstition at JPL. All of our successful missions are only enabled by eating peanuts in mission control just before the event happens. Uh, but this was COVID, so we had to eat them outside. So we took a picture of them eating outside uh, before we went in uh, and landed Perseverance on Mars. So with that, I can take any questions. Thank you.